Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, that this podcast is being delivered on the unceded territory of Laguentian, Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanish peoples, <clears throat> whose historical relationship with the land continues to this day. As well, I'd like to acknowledge that during the European colonization of British Columbia, actually very few treaties were signed with local First Nations. <clears throat> And at the moment, several nations have entered into negotiations as part of the modern BC Treaty Commission process, but the majority of the land in British Columbia remains unceded. That is the ter territory that was not surrendered through a treaty or war. So <clears throat> I thought I would be begin with this quotation from John A. MacDonald that he made to the House of Commons in 1879. Johnny McDonald was not only our first prime minister, but he was responsible for introducing the Indian Act. And he uh, basically also introduced residential schools. So as you can re read it <coughs> for yourself, um, particularly the second paragraph, it has been strongly impressed upon myself as head of the department, that is Indian Affairs, that Indian children should be withdrawn as much as possible from parental influence. And the only way to do that would be to put them in central training industrial schools while they will acquire the habits and modes of thought of white men. And in the above paragraph, they refer to Aboriginals as savages, the families and parents of these children as savages. And the result of his um, involvement in establishing residential schools is the following statistics. Um, talking about 150,000 Aboriginal children were placed in some sort of residential care facility. <clears throat> uh, many of them operated by various religious organization churches. And as it states, in the first paragraph, assimilation, segregation, integration was the primary goal. Uh, operation, operationalizing uh, John A. McDonald's philosophy that the Aboriginal culture and families were basically savages. Um, <clears throat> so the third paragraph states the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, committee stated that approx approximately 2% of the, the 150,000 children who were in residential care died while in care. That's the official number. The number probably is actually quite a bit higher. I think one of the things th that has struck me and why I chose to do this is the fact that I think a lot of us were raised and understood the issue of uh, colonization and even to some degree, the residential schools, but I believe it was the pub publicizing of the unmarked graves starting in Kamloops in front of those closed residential schools where people could actually see where children were buried, primarily children. There were some staff, but primarily children were buried. <clears throat> and I think that, that I think sort of made it real. One of the interesting things about British Columbia is that we have a very significant number of what are called private schools or here in BC called independent schools. So there are a significant number of, of parents, families who have their children in independent schools, who, in quote, residential schools, but expensive ones. So I think if, if approximately 2% of their children died while in the care of those schools, it would be of some concern. And so I, it makes sense to me that um, <clears throat> That, that this be a subject we looked at. I retired from working in the federal correctional system after about 28 years, and I still do a little bit of private practice uh, in the criminal justice and uh, social services system. And one thing, one of the things that struck me, which I think ho hopefully is now getting to be whether be better understood is some of the statistics I've put up here. And um, they sort of speak for themselves. Um, 
indigenous people make up approximately 5% of the BC population. Um, and they represent about over almost a third of female youth in custody. And in 2006, and that number has increased to approximately 60%. Uh, and so in males, it's, it's just about 44%. As I say, they make up about 5% of the population. So that, that is a, uh, in my opinion, that's a significant issue. The other piece of this that's made the news uh, periodically uh, is the fact that um, <coughs> about 52% of the children in foster care in Canada uh, are Aboriginal and they make up just slightly less than 8% of the population. So that means out of approximately 20, 28,000, 20, 29,000, uh, just about 15,000 of those kids are Aboriginal. And in BC, um, as it states in the stat below, <clears throat> Indigenous children makes up slightly less than 10% of the uh, population of children in this province, and they make up just under 63% of the kids in foster care. So uh, John A. McDonald's um, philosophy, ideology about taking kids out of their home, setting up the residential school system is still having its impact 140 years later. That's intergenerational trauma, in my opinion. So I think one of the things that's uh, important here uh, and and Gagne and, and many others have talked about this that conservatively at least two generations of first nations kids have been lost meaning uh, taken out of the home having their culture taken away from them their language uh, resulting in some of those statistics that I just pointed out. Uh, Overrepresentation over representation in the criminal justice system and overrepresentation, dramatically overrepresentation in the social services. So, what does that indicate? In my opinion, it's the breakdown of the culture and the family. As I say, that continues since late 1870s. And we're still there. So I think so. It should be noted, and I think it's important. I'm going to focus just on on First Nations, but um, trauma does affect a, a, a number of groups of people, and can uh, uh, across generations in a number of a number of important areas. So we have um, people coming from other countries. Uh, I was working with a number of people in the criminal justice system who had immigrated here from Vietnam, who were living in camps, refugee camps in Vietnam uh, for a number of years. And they were coming over here and were very significantly traumatized. Uh, we're getting uh, Afghani or trying to get people who are um, trying to get away from the Taliban. And uh, you can be assured that there's going to be a significant amount of trauma involved there. Political refugees, <clears throat> uh, people who have lived through uh, natural uh, disasters, um, depending on where you're living, places like Japan, where there have multiple earthquakes, multiple tsunamis. It's been a very, it, it can, and it is a very traumatic experience. So anybody who's been through those kinds of experiences, some of those things can have very long lasting effects. And then the bottom one is sort of uh, self-explanatory in some ways. The survivors of abuse, uh, directly or vicarious abuse, ma makes very little difference, interestingly, in terms of the impact in terms of trauma. So physical, sexual, emotional, psychological abuse uh, can continue through generations. So I'm just focusing on the Aboriginal people uh, in Canada, but just to emphasize that trauma can have impacts in a, with a variety of populations. And you may have friends or family or who've come from one of these kind of situations and they are 
equally likely in, in many ways to have significant issues in their life related to trauma. And it's important that people recognize uh, some of these differences. Um, intergener interge you know, I guess you can't hardly see that. Intergenerational trauma, sometimes referred to as intergeneration intergener trauma, is a term that's used to describe the impact of traumatic experience, not only on one generation, but subsequent generations. And it's the um, the transmission of the trauma <clears throat> can come about in many ways due to the lack of awareness of the impact on the person or the community. And, and I believe this is also relevant here in Canada with regard to the First Nations, the stigma attached to receiving treatment for these physical as well as mental health concerns. So I think in some ways, up until, well, I mean, currently, I mean, frankly, uh, the issue of providing resources to people who've experienced trauma has been somewhat limited. I am the uh, currently the chair of the what's referred to as the Men's Therapy Center. It was formerly referred to as the Men's Trauma Center in Victoria. I joined the board uh, about three years ago out of interest. We are the only uh, trauma center, therapy center for men experiencing trauma or perpetrators of trauma for on, on their victims on Vancouver Island. There's just us for men. Services are a little bit more complete for women and children, but not much. So this has been an area that frankly has not been dealt with very effectively. There have been a number of very high profile and tragic cases in the Canadian military of service people coming back from overseas, primarily with peace, peacekeeping, seeing horrendous kind of issues and come back and experiencing very significant problems. Some of you may be familiar with General Romeo Dallaire. He's written a number of very excellent books. He was in charge of the UN peacekeeping mission in um, in the 1960s and 70s um, where he witnessed the uh, basically the genocide of the community that he was looking for and he came back from that experience and he was a general he was a very experienced person he came back to Canada after his deployment in that area and developed a very very serious problem with alcoholism to the point that he had to basically resign the blackouts, the um, traumatic memories, et cetera, et cetera, of witnessing people getting arms, legs cut off, macheted. It was a very serious, and he's written some very good books, and he's been out here talking about PTSD and trauma in the military. So this is another area that it, we are starting to, but not done a great job uh, in terms of recognizing the problem and then putting the resources in as necessary. It's, it's improving, but not like it should be. So I, I put this up um, just to make the point that, um, and this is, this is uh, primarily Canadian data. Um, and you can read it for yourself. So significant amounts of domestic violence, significant amounts of, of abuse, neglect. So we're talking a very significant portion of the population who can over time develop these traumatic kind of reactions. And as I'm, you can hopefully will understand by the end of this is that if that's not dealt with, if those major deficits, which is clearly true in the First Nations community, are not dealt with in a healthy and responsible way. They do affect parenting. They do affect cultural activities. Um, and that those problems get passed on to their children and then to their children. So they very high levels of abuse. 
that occur on many of our reserves, sadly, today around substance abuse, physical sexual abuse, as demonstrated by the very high rates of incarceration and number of kids in care, which is the overt manifestation of the breakdown in the family structure, is in my opinion, largely the result of this unresolved, undealt uh, trauma issues that have not been dealt with effectively. And a matter of fact, have been ignored. Uh, and in the First Nations community, there has been a hesitancy to come forward and talk about these things and address these things with authority, given the fact that their history is that it was those people in authority who caused the problem originally. So having some hesitancy about tending school, not totally, but does explain to some degree why the graduation rates, for example, of First Nations children are quite significantly lower than Caucasian children. The number of children in foster care, the parents not having good parenting skills, not having learned that from their parents because of what they experienced, uh, just manifests itself, continues to manifest itself in ongoing deficits, serious deficits, uh, which in turn, I perpetuates itself. And so I think the issue that, that we need to look at, I mean, a number of these issues, this is this presentation, it's only kind of touching the surface, but I thought it would be important to raise some of the major issues. <clears throat> and so uh, there are a significant number of people who do experience trauma, who don't recognize the seriousness of the symptoms they're having. And so depending on the family and the background and social circumstances and economic circumstances, some of this, uh, the, the, the problems that they're experiencing psychologically, emotionally, physically are not necessarily recognized as being related to what's happened before. Um, and so um, what's, ha in my opinion, what's happened is that some of the serious, serious psychological disorders, psychiatric disorders, psychological problems that people have experienced. Uh, and I've just put a number of them and the, the serious, I mean, the major ones, for example, for me are like, uh, are, are for example, substance abuse, denial, isolation, approximately 75% of, of federal and provincial inmates, approximately 75% have substance abuse issues. And as Dr. Gabor Maté, who's done some fabulous work in this area and done, presents some excellent workshops, his argument is absolutely substance abuse, the drug addiction, et cetera, the, the problems we're having with opioid de deaths, et cetera, here is not the problem. The problem is not having dealt with the cause of the substance abuse, in his case, uh, and I happen to agree with him, as you can probably gather, is trauma. His argument is for those people, it is the unresolved grief, loss, depression, et cetera, causing people to have to self-medicate because they haven't dealt with the underlying issue. So alcoholism, drug addiction is not the problem. The trauma is trauma. And if you're going to resolve the substance abuse problems, you got to get at the core. So these symptoms, and for many people, uh, when I was taking courses and, and, and uh, workshops on this, that was not mentioned very often. Substance abuse was seen as a, a thing onto itself, being clinically depressed. Generalized anxiety disorders were not tied into, were not understood in the context of some of this historical or some of this background serious difficulties that people have experienced. It's only been in the last few years that this has come about. Um, and so first responders, the military and clearly the Aboriginal community, that has also been true. So the issues that they have experienced with regard to these serious, serious concerns the etiology, the cause has, in my opinion, has not been accurately diagnosed, recognized. 
and therefore the treatment interventions that have been used do work sometimes, uh, for sure. But the reason most many people, most people relapse, if we're talking about substance abuse, the reason lots of people benefit from psychotropic medication for anxiety and depression, but it certainly doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't cure, in quotes, the depression. And the reason is, is that it is not solely a biological issue. And so it's this, in my opinion, it's this, these issues that we're talking about here that you need to explore as a, as a psychologist or a social worker, or physician, whoever, is it's, it's the person's history. It's the background, the history. What are the significant events that have taken place that have caused very serious impairment, detriment, a serious negative reaction? What are those things? And when did they occur and how did they occur? And getting to process that those experiences that and I believe would be much more effective in dealing with some of these issues um, because we're actually dealing with the problem. <clears throat> so, and the other, and again, I, I just raised this because these, these are other symptoms that are evident that people don't necessarily uh, um, attribute to any kind of background event or series of events or as i say traumatic experience um and so yeah and the argument the, the people are now making who are studying this pretty pretty significantly is that at least considering that clients patients who have some of these underlying issues that we're talking about here need to at least have the opportunity for the therapist, counselor, whoever, to talk about these things in that context. And I think that's very important. Um, so nightmares, fearfulness, insomnia, um, poor impulse control, serious, serious issues with anger management, et cetera. Um, pretty significant social deficits, interpersonal skills, poor communication skills. Again, um, looking at it through this lens, looking at it through the perspective of what, what has happened to this person in the past, I think will be much more clinically efficacious. The other piece of this is that, another big um, symptom, if you want to call it that, or issue that I experienced when I was interviewing and still, still do interview and work with people in the criminal justice system and the mental health system is the fact that they don't remember a lot of details. When you ask them about their, their childhood, their history, they don't have great recollection. Some of them don't even have great recollection of even adolescence or early adulthood. Um, and they're not making it up. They don't remember. And it's a, it is a manifestation there that the, the traumatic experience they had during that period has dramatically impacted their ability to recall that material. One of the major symptoms of PTSD is, is flashbacks having recurring memories that you're reliving the experience over and over again. Now, fortunately, we're recognizing that, yes, these triggering events that happened many, many, many years ago still are relevant today. Under the right circumstances, people can be triggered and those memories can return. It's important. Uh, individuals who have a great deal of social anxiety, who are call it a number of different kinds of things, schizoid personality disorder, uh, avoidant personality, whatever, that, that worldview of where they're afraid, scared, um, 
for no apparent reason, if you're just looking at their recent history or their recent background, misses the point. It's the stuff that goes back to what their parents or parents and grandparents experienced. And again, if we're talking about in the context of, of uh, the First Nations community, their interactions with uh, priests, nuns, teachers, social workers, uh, attached to the school system, attached to working on the reserve was very traumatic. Uh, they had the power, those individuals, to take their children away from them and put them in a place where they didn't come back. So that fear of certain kinds of institutions, certain kinds of uh, government structures uh, is real. And on some level, the ch they're, they're these people's children and grandchildren who have picked that up have recognized that. So not saying anything, not attending school, but not telling people why, not being cooperative with their social worker, not being cooperative with their psychologist, not wanting to talk about these things, coming from an experience where that kind of information, that kind of disclosure has been used against them not allowing, not being allowed to talk, uh, use their mother tongue, not being able to speak about their spiritual activities, not being able to talk about the relationships they had with their mother and father out of fear that something really bad will happen to them by those people in authority. It does, in my opinion, help illuminate why there are some significant individuals who have issues with that latter point. So I think it's, it's nice to, uh, it's important to think about some of the other, some of the clinical issues that we are dealing with on a very regular basis um, from this kind of context. So um, this is kind of a, Um, I, just, a, just a very quick kind of overview. Um, so the use of punishment, coercion, physical abuse, um, and overt control by teachers, by social workers, all those people that I was talking about in the residential in the in the residential system, but even on the reserve system. Uh, was a reflection of John A. McDonald's very strong belief that that was necessary, that those tools, those methods, those coercive children were taken out of the home and put on reserve. The, the 60s scoop, 1960s, not 1860s, 1960s scoop, where significant numbers of Aboriginal children were taken out of the family was, again, once a, a reflection of this type of attitude, of this kind of belief, organizational structural belief by many social service agencies and, and um, spiritual organization churches who thought they were acting in the best interest of their children, of these children that they were taking into care <coughs> by removing them from their families and culture. And if necessary to do so forcefully because it was in those children's best interest. So they believed. So that philosophy, going back to John A, has continued in some quarters, basically to the present time. And so these kind of methods of dealing with children, uh, in my experience, has directly led to a Unfortunately, a significant number of these people engaging in very serious substance abuse, which then in turn has led to a whole bunch of other social uh, problems, including crime, violent crime, and sexual crimes, which unfortunately is very uh, prevalent on a number of the reserves in our country. 
And even underlying that, I'm, I know a number of you are probably very well aware, the single biggest contributor in terms of factor variable leading to those, contributing to those other major social issues is um, poverty. The one major overarching, most serious contributing and in, to some degree causal factor is high levels of poverty, intergenerational poverty. And it's been in the news repeatedly, still a significant number of reserves in this country do not, do not have clean water. So the economic infrastructure that much of the rest of Canada has experienced has not been available to the First Nations community. And instead, as a result of that poverty, as a result of that neglect, uh, families not being able to provide for their children, not being able to provide proper nutrition, supervision, et cetera, then leads to what? Them being taken into care. So the issue goes for full circle. So we're back to where we started. And so it is a very serious <clears throat> concern. And as you can read from the slide, the major impact of that has been that many, many First Nation survivors just do not develop the appropriate parenting skills. They came out of the residential school experience, separated from their culture, separated from their family, and not only separated, but having it demeaned, ridiculed. And as a result, they just did not have the skills to parent uh, uh, appropriately in a healthy manner. And ergo, what do you have? High levels of domestic violence, high level of partner violence, family violence. And so, is it? and again, it's the same statistic just presented in a slightly different way. Yes, when over half of the children in care in Canada are First Nations, it is the breakdown in the family. And as that third paragraph, uh, 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 Maggie uh, Hodgson wrote about, it is going to get passed on from generation to generation. The damage that is caused from one generation to the parenting and the child rearing in the next generation, them being neglected and all this stuff that we've talked about that you're aware of, without some major intervention, without some ma major recognition, it does become 2022. And here we sit having a, uh, a workshop about stuff that has never been dealt with at least on any kind of systematic way. And it's, it's in many ways, not getting any better. So one of the things that I wanted to cover at least briefly was the fact that how is trauma transmitted intergenerationally? Um, and so I'm going to cover it very briefly. This is a huge topic, but in essence, the, this is not a surprise, uh, sadly, um, parents are so preoccupied working on their own issues that they don't have the time or the skills necessary to parent their children. And as a result, children having to raise themselves, as it were, or raised in an environment where they were exposed to high levels of violence and substance abuse, et cetera. So the trauma is transmitted, passed on, whatever, uh, as a result of basically the parents not having the wherewithal to know how to man manage, look after, themselves, let alone their children. And that has been now conservatively three generations of that. 
so again, there are various models as to how trauma is is transmitted. Uh, I've briefly covered three of them, uh, but again, this is another huge issue. Um, three major categories, social, cultural, psychological, and then this phys physiological. And so why is that, you know, why is it important to look at the transmission? Well, we've got to do something in terms of much more effective intervention. But in order to do that, as I say, you've got to kind of got to, got to have some sort of understanding as to, oh, I can't see that very well. Let's see if I can do something with that. Oh, it's all right. So what's, what this basically says is that that is um, parents who are affected by trauma uh, are basically unable to, to handle um, what's going on for their children because they're the, the lens that they're looking at the world through, at their culture, at their family through has been so severely distorted by what the experience they had growing up that um, they sort of become emotionally detached from um, their own families, from their own, even from their own experiences. Uh, and as they do uh, act in those kind of kind of detached, emotionally inappropriate, kinds of psychologically inappropriate kinds of ways, um, the world does become an unsafe place for those children. The unpredictability of people, for example, who've got serious substance abuse problems. Is dad or mom going to be in, in, intoxicated and angry or violent or happy or, or whatever? The unpredictability, the, the lack of, of safety, the lack of stability, in the family unit and then in the community is a very significant contributing factor to a lot of people's ex experience of trauma. You can see pretty clearly, I think, why somebody would be anxious or depressed or angry about growing up in an environment where they do not know what's going to happen to them when they walk in the door at home. That's pretty serious stuff. So again, one of the major issues, one of the major contributing factors is the fact that, yeah, psychologically, the family members just don't, are, ju are just sort of have sort of stepped out of the, the picture. Um, and I, I'll, I should have just, <clears throat> when, when you see, uh, I'll, I'll clean up these slides. Unfortunately, uh, they, they came out darker than they should have. But what basically those slides are saying is that um, when the children are, when somebody doesn't teach you as a child the appropriate skills, the appropriate mechanism for handling problems, uh, the result is that what do children do? Well, they see their friends, they see their family, the other family members, uh, et cetera, trying to cope with these things. And um, and unfortunately, in many Aboriginal communities, there is a wide range of dysfunction. So children playing with other children who are coming from that, from similar kinds of backgrounds, they're, they're learning inappropriate things from the people who they hopefully would be able to get, get better information if their parents aren't there. So negative parenting, if you want to call it that, uh, is very serious. And again, the, the thing that's well, one of the major issues for, for Canada and British Columbia is that a lot of the reserves are in very isolated areas. They're actually quite small and there's not a big community. Some of the reserves are quite small. And even those reserves that are within the uh, sort of an urban area, uh, the, the conflicts, the stressors that go on with living in that kind of environment also brings another whole level. But it's the isolation and the, the lack of, of uh, resources, healthy resources, that prevent people from getting help. And it's a very serious problem. It, it continues to be a very serious problem. <clears throat> 
So again, I mean, this is this is a big area, and but any of you who are into attachment theory, you know what we're talking about here. Early stimulation, early support, um, caring, affection, etc., uh, is essential. If if there are serious deficits in those areas, major negative impact. There have been very, you know, historically there have been very sad stories of of children being adopted to Canada from Eastern European countries where they were basically not picked up, not talked to, not in, you know, from birth to, you know, the two or three, and the deficits, the personality deficits, the the major kind of behavioral things from being that neglected is a very been very detrimental. Well, it's similar in some ways in some communities with our First Nations because their parents have just not been there for them or their grandparents because they've had to, you know, they're dealing with their own stuff. So one of the arguments that is being made and the research sort of supports it is that when that level of uh, attachment disorder, unhealthy attachment occurs uh, in a community, the psychological damage that that causes can be perpetrated across generations and is. So one of the mechanisms is the fact that uh, because the children have not been subjected to or, or not subjected to, but, but exposed to a healthy, loving, caring environment in too many cases. And as a matter of fact, they've experienced the opposite. Very serious problems occur. And so again, going back a generation or two generations, when their mother, grand, grandmother, grandfather were yanked out of the family home and separated completely and, and forcefully and abusively required to not participate in their culture, to not use their language, to not associate with, associate with other members of the family. That kind of learning continues. Um, and again, this is, you can read this uh, stuff for yourself, but that the argument is, is that uh, toxic, what they refer to as toxic stress caused by a very dysfunctional family uh, childhood environment does affect uh, neurological development. And for that matter, personality development, but this is focusing on the physiological stuff. <coughs> so that they talk about abnormal levels of cortisol, abnormal levels of, of serotonin, uh, et cetera, which then leads to a, a, other very serious psychological and uh, um, emotional issues. Um, so the one that most of us are familiar with is FSAD. F FASD, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder stuff, where the the consumption of some sort of drugs or alcohol by mom as well as dad do have a very negative impact on, for example, cognitive development, as well as some of the behavioral and poor impulse control, anger management. So what they're suggesting here is that, yes, it could be substance abuse, but it could also be just very, very high levels of stress, conflict, neglect that kind of environment, having a child exposed to that then also contributes to delays, significant delays, significant deficits in certain major areas, i.e. interpersonal functioning, self-esteem, self-image, uh, problem solving. So they're linking the, the transmission of intergenerational trauma to the child being exposed to very high levels of stress on a long-term on a you know, on a long-term basis so that's important as well to think about so again i mean i've got a few minutes here so the interventions it i mean this is where we have to <coughs> and again most of this is pretty pretty straightforward um but it's got to be culturally informed. 
if we're going to do effective treatment, and we're talking about First Nations community here, I'm, I'm talking about individual group treatment, whatever, it's got to be informed by the culture, spiritual activities, of family structure uh, of that community. Us going in as white whoever is not, in my opinion, it's just not going to work. Uh, the healing has to take place within the the environment, the culture, the the the, the first nation in and of itself. So culturally responsive therapy, strength based, trauma based intervention, strength based, as opposed to constantly focusing on what people cannot do, building on strengths is really important given what's going on here, given what's happened and what's happened generationally, um, it's going to take a lot of work. But this becomes significant. And so I'm arguing that you need people who are trained in trauma, trained in trauma-informed therapy, trained in cultural, Aboriginal cultural uh, understanding spiritual understandings who also can work from a trauma-informed perspective like i've tried to say and hopefully made some sense trauma is the issue uh, drug addiction violence you name it crime family domestic abuse very serious issues that's not Interview, intervening at that level uh, on those specific things without addressing, in my opinion, th this, this, what we're talking about here is not going to be very effective and hasn't been uh, because there have been, you know, in some communities, some areas, let's, there have been a real attempt, there have been real resources put into counseling and therapy and treatment and programming and, you know, et cetera. Uh, and they have been okay, but not really. The, the number of kids going into foster First Nations going into foster care has improved a little bit. The graduation rates for First Nations children has improved some, um, but it's still way overrepresented in all the major social and, and criminal justice issue uh, agencies, institutions. And I think it's because of this. I think it's because we have not got at the underlying issues. And it's that, it's, that's gotta be the focus. Uh, if we're going to be effective. So. And again, this is, this just speaks for itself. It's not just the individual that's been traumatized. It's the family and it's the culture. And so if you're going to intervene you're going to have to intervene on that kind of a, you're going to have to get buy-in from the family and the extended family. And so having the First Nations, in this case, we're talking First Nations uh, interventions optimally should be delivered by people in their own community or people who are familiar with the traditions, spiritual activities, family structures, et cetera and can work from that understanding. But looking at it, not just as an individual problem, but as a, as a bigger concern. So again, this is just, this is, you know, pretty self-evident, but it's important, right? got to access the strengths you got to build on those strengths you got to build on what the client brings to this to the uh problem the family the community brings and how do you work with that and and what's the best way to maximize uh, the strengths as well as a, a deal with the stuff that is could very well be historical and in my opinion, often is historical. So I think it's really necessary. And clearly from my perspective doing this, 
we need to really, really commit ourselves. And in light of what's happened with COVID and the enormous stressors that have occurred because of isolation, um, lack of community supports, not being able to attend AA, NA meetings because the churches are closed and they haven't been able to see their sponsor or their counselor, the amount of domestic abuse that's uh, has increased, not just in First Nations, but generally alcohol consumption has gone up, uh, uh, domestic violence has increased, et cetera. Well, you just magnify that with this. So I think putting the resources into mental health um, in order to help let's climb up, Senich, pick something. The uh, um, Aboriginal communities develop the skills within their own community to be able to deal with these things is going to be money well spent. I was talking to somebody else about this when I was in um, working in the federal system to uh, to house one inmate in a medium security prison in uh, in a CSC, which is Correctional Services of Canada, it was somewhere between one hundred and ten and one hundred and thirty thousand dollars a year per individual. For females in a female correctional system, it's something like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year per female inmate. And in the youth custody, it's it's. Uh, about the same amount, maybe even a little more than that. By diverting even a small percentage of the resources we're putting in the correctional system into the mental health system and dealing with the issues like I hopefully described at that level, I think we can do something about the incarceration rates, the foster care rates, the, the, the breakdown of the family structure, but it's got to start from a perception that it is tr tr trauma that is the real causal factor. And if you put the resources in that area, I think you can make a difference. And on that note, I believe I'm done.